pyramids dotted and rippled across the landscape. Inside these mounds, unusual pottery and ornate artifacts were often found next to human remains of an ancient people that vanished long ago. For over 2,000 years, ancient peoples left their marks throughout the eastern half of the country, referred to as the woodlands. Hundreds of sites containing thousands of earthworks were discovered. Looking at this undertaking in its entirety, it is clear that the labors of the North American mound builders were of such magnitude that these structures are one of the great accomplishments of early mankind. The first Europeans to explore North America came across huge earthworks, mounds which excited their curiosity and their greed for the treasures that might be found inside them. Early excavations uncovered an extraordinary amount of beautifully crafted pottery and artifacts. Many showed sophisticated workmanship and were evidence of elaborate trading networks that brought goods from as far off as the Rocky Mountains and the Gulf of Mexico, a distance of more than a thousand miles. A number of the ancient graves that were excavated revealed elaborate burial practices. This all seemed far too exotic to be indigenous to the New World. Attempting to make sense of these baffling earthen structures, later visitors to North America refused to accept that they were the work of ancient Indians. To them, the finds were evidence that a more sophisticated culture had once thrived there. Not only did the current lifestyle of the Indians seem unrelated, but the Indians themselves seemed unaware of who had built the mounds. Anxious for a solution, Americans at the time came up with other explanations. The earliest interpretations of the people who built the mounds was that they couldn't have been Native Americans. They had to have been uh, constructed by someone coming in from somewhere else, whether they were lost Welch tribes or lost children of Israel or Maya from South America or something like that. But in fact, they do appear to be, and there's no evidence to suggest that they're not, purely indigenous. The people who were living here at the time constructed them. Even the lost continent of Atlantis was included in these lost race theories. The ideas presented not only seemed exciting and magical, but were probably promoted to increase the value of the artifacts by those plundering the mounds for profit. These theories also gained support from the racist notion that Indians were not sufficiently civilized or ambitious to have been responsible for such feats. When these lost civilization explanations lost credibility, another rose to replace it. The mounds were natural geological features formed through unusual erosion. Believers pointed out that America was filled with other spectacular and unique natural landforms. The artifacts were often explained as coming from tribes that lived on these natural landforms at different times. Part of the problem, of course, was that the science of archaeology was in its infancy. Other tribes had indeed inhabited the sites both before and after the era of mound construction. But without modern dating techniques and a total understanding of population densities, the confusion is understandable. It is hard to believe how the largest ancient structures in North America could ever have been misinterpreted as geological forms even though hundreds of years of weather and vegetation had obscured them. We now know that Western Illinois was once home to America's largest prehistoric population at a site we call Cahokia. And yet this ancient monument was just barely saved from being plowed under. It was in the 1920s that uh, Warren K. Moorhead, an archeologist came here to help the effort for the state to acquire this property. He did this by excavating in the mounds, some places between the mounds, to find objects, pottery, worked shell, 
flint work that would demonstrate that uh, these mounds were not only lived upon by Indians, but they were built by Indians, and that these were uh, uh, man-made, these were artificial. In the case of Monk's Mound, it was almost a magic mountain. Monk's Mound is the largest prehistoric earthwork in the entire Western Hemisphere. Its base covers over 14 acres. It stands 100 feet high and has several terraces. Excavations have revealed that there was a huge building at the top. This construction was over 104 feet long and about 48 feet wide, a room at the top where the paramount ruler would have lived and governed his community, as well as being the setting for ritual and ceremonial activities. We estimate that there's at least 22 million cubic feet of earth in Monk's Mound. And someone has figured out this would be over 14 and a half million basket loads of dirt that were probably carried on the Indians' backs, load after load. So a tremendous expenditure of human labor, time, and material to construct this mound. But it wasn't all done at once. It was done in a series of stages. And from excavations and corings we've done through the mound, we can identify many building stages. So perhaps as a leader would die, they'd burn down or tear down the old building on top, add more dirt, put up a new building for the new leader. So the mound gradually increased in size. Monk's Mound stood at the center of what is often referred to as America's first great city. Archaeological data indicates that the site came into existence around 800 AD and flourished for around 500 years. Monk's Mound was one of the first examples of what has become known as the Mississippian culture. Large temple mounds are the primary feature that defines a Mississippian site and these can be found throughout the Mississippi River Valley. Early theories about their construction claimed the mounds could only have been built with slave labor. That was certainly the prevalent view when race theories abounded. At that time, the mounds were often compared to Egypt's pyramids, but today, these theories have been rejected. The analogy to understand the construction of the mounds that I think is appropriate is to look at the cathedrals of Europe. Monumental constructions that were built by people in a very primitive state of technology, some taking hundreds of years to build. From what we can tell, no one was forced. In fact, there were competitions among European groups to build cathedrals. I believe the Mississippian mound construction probably falls very much into that line. It was an honor to be involved in the construction of a sacred edifice that in fact made your group powerful and was a symbol of that power. Cahokia had the largest earthworks and might have been the greatest power on the continent at that time. This power arose from the efforts of the successful and influential people who inhabited America's first great metropolis. The prehistoric mounds of North America are the most striking remains of Cahokia's lost culture. Thanks to exhaustive research and analysis, we now may be able to get a true picture of who the mound builders were and what life was like for the inhabitants of this great metropolis. 30 years ago, uh, about the time I first started working at Cahokia, the concept was that this was a vacant ceremonial center with these mounds where people would come in at, on various special occasions. But with all of the detailed work that's been done since then, our concept has totally changed. We now feel that it was a large center with a resident population in the five figures and with very specialized subdivisions of the site. Uh, for instance, areas that look like suburbs or barrios of Cahokia, each with its own plaza and its own platform mound and its own burial mound. Uh, the area within the Palisade is what I call downtown Cahokia. The Palisade was a fortress wall two miles long around Monk's Mound demonstrating that earthworks were not the only great architectural accomplishments of the Mississippians. The evidence of this once great wall was discovered in 1966, when the locations of dark lines on aerial photographs were found to be portions of trenches. 
Thousands of 20-foot-tall timbers had been embedded in these trenches to construct a fortified stockade. It's a possibility that the walls may have been plastered with a, a heavy coating of clay and grass mixed together we call daub. And in this part here, we've simulated that. We know from historical accounts in the southeast that when DeSoto and his expedition were traveling through there and fighting with Indians, they described walls just like this that were heavily plastered with clay. So we assume that it's a possibility here at Cahokia, although we've found no positive proof of it. While the wall undoubtedly had defensive purposes, uh, I think it also served as a social barrier between uh, the general population and the elite that lived within this center, including the paramount ruler of Cahokia, who undoubtedly lived on top of Monk's Mountain. About the same time that the stockade was discovered, the evidence of another timber structure was unearthed. This appeared to be the American equivalent of Stonehenge. This post circle, this American wood hinge, is uh, thought of as a solar calendar or a solar observatory because an observer uh, standing next to this center post would see the sun uh, rising over the post behind me with the two white marks, which we, which we have put there, on the first day of spring and the first day of fall, the equinox days, and would uh, also see the sun rising over two other posts on the first day of winter and the first day of summer, the solstice posts. Now, this post circle defined a, a social space, an area where games could be played, where rituals could be performed, and also for helping to focus the energy of nature into this location. Uh, Indians regarded circles as representing the earth, and so this circle probably was thought of as symbolizing the earth in microcosm. North American native populations did not use written language. Artifacts alone would provide the clues for understanding this vanished culture. It was assumed that there was some uniformity in the symbolism in the religious beliefs of the Native American cultures, and this became the basis for interpretation. The sandstone tablet I'm holding was found in, the, in excavations on the east side of Monk's Mound, and engraved on its surface was a design of a, a man wearing a bird-like mask, holding a wing up to one side in sort of a dancing posture. And on the reverse side is a crosshatch design, which some people believe interprets the uh, underworld serpent. So we have embodied on this tablet then the underworld being the serpent, this world being the man and the upper world, the bird representation. In Mississippian symbolism and motifs and belief systems, these were major realms of the, of the spirit world. It is estimated that at its peak in around 1100 AD, Cahokia had between 20 to 40,000 citizens. Only highly developed agricultural skills could have supported a city of such size. What I'm holding in my hand is a Mississippian hoe. Uh, it's manufactured from a church from southern Illinois. There are quarries located in that area in which uh, the people there locally would manufacture these objects, ship them up to Cahokia, as well as the smaller communities where they would be used in, in cultivating their fields as well as in the excavation of their houses. With a population too dense to be supported by the natural flora and fauna of the surrounding countryside, and with bountiful harvests a matter of life and death, an obsession with fertility was a constant theme of their culture. We have here an example of a type of pottery, which is fairly rare at Cahokia. Now, the symbolism involved in this piece has to do with agricultural fertility. One of the classic designs is shown on this vessel. If you can see this scroll that wraps around here, it indicates rain, and it uh, indicates water in general. And we think that this was distributed probably at one of the major ceremonials at Cahokia, which is called the Green Corn Ceremony. The construction of the mounds was certainly a central part of ceremonial life in Cahokia, and their size, shape, and location gave them a unique symbolism. More than 120 were built, each one with its own special significance and purpose. Behind me is Mound 72. I was interested in this because it's 
differs from many of the other mounds at Cahokia site. One difference is its shape. The other is its orientation along different axes than the rest of the mound. So we came up with the interpretation that these ridge mounds were marker mounds marking important locations at the Cahokia. When we excavated, we found that the mound contained about 280 burials. The most important individual buried in the mound was laid out on a platform of several thousand shell beads. This group of beads made the pattern of a large bird. So we have the Birdman theme that's so common at Cahokia in this burial. Near these remains were huge caches of artifacts. Deeper down lay four male skeletons, each without heads or hands, along with the remains of 53 young women. It's not surprising to find evidence of sacrifices at the burials of the elite in chieftain societies. These rituals were performed not only by the Mississippians, but in most world cultures in similar stages of their evolution. One of the things that we have to back off of when we're thinking about Cahokia is we, we have to not think of Cahokia, again, in European terms, as like the Cahokian Empire. Cahokia probably, in reality, never controlled any areas more than about 50 miles from the site of Cahokia. It did not seem to be involved in that kind of conquest. It had influences throughout the Midwest and the Eastern United States, but they were influences through the passing on of religious beliefs and through trade, not through warfare. It was not a conquest state, it was simply a very large, very successful group of farmers who for a short time did very well by themselves. The people here played games using puck-like objects called chunky stones, found at this and many other sites. They adorned themselves with piercings and tattoos, as shown in their human effigies. But they, like all Mississippian societies, were doomed to extinction. It was about 12,000 years ago when the glaciers of the Ice Age receded to the north. The environment became fit for human habitation in the Middle Eastern part of what is now the United States. The early Paleo Indians focused their efforts on big game hunting and continued this practice for several thousand years. About 3,000 years ago, the woodland period began, and with it came some very important changes. For the first time, Indians looked primarily to the earth for food and dug into the earth to reshape their environment. This is a, a worldwide phenomenon at about this time frame. People were building very similar structures in many other parts of the world. It occurs at a time when there's a shift in economies from hunting and gathering to cultivation. And what they represent on one level is that someone had to have enough control over people to say, we need to do this. We need to work cooperatively to do that. With uh, hunting and gathering cultures, you, you don't have that. Everyone's equal. No one can tell other people what to do and expect them to do it. Given that these are generally ceremonial sites, the idea is that we're generally talking about religious practices. And so it is something that we need to build these kinds of structures because the gods deem it necessary. The earliest mound building culture in North America is known as the Adena complex. Many of their mounds reveal several burial practices that included complete inhumations, cremations, and bundle burials. The Adena didn't build their temple mounds in the shape of pyramids, but they constructed their own fascinating structures, including an earthen observatory dating back to 160 BC. Located in the Anderson Mound site, north of Indianapolis, Indiana. This is the central platform of the Great Mound enclosure in Anderson Mounds. You can see the embankment here behind me, constructed by excavating a ditch, throwing the dirt to the outside, and piling it up in an embankment. In essence, what was done was a false horizon was created to observe the sunset. There are slight depressions in the embankment that I'm sure were much more obvious originally. Behind me is the dip where the sun sets at the winter solstice, though it's obscured now by tree growth. 
And over here is the dip where the sun sets at the equinox, and this depression marks where the sun sets at the summer solstice. Around the embankment, there are other dips and depressions that are lined up for the rising and setting points of bright stars. The Edina are probably responsible for one of the most curious and inexplicable earthen constructions ever found. Slithering across the landscape in southern Ohio, the Great Serpent Mound is the world's largest snake effigy. 20 feet wide and 5 feet high, it is nearly a quarter of a mile long. In the 19th century, a tower was built so that tourists could view this enigma. The symbolism of the oval in the mouth of the snake draws the most speculation. It's been interpreted as an egg, a frog, or the world itself. It is believed to be the work of the Adena because the site of a nearby village contains Adena markings. But since effigy mounds contain no artifacts, the Great Serpent Mound defies efforts to understand it. It was around 100 BC that the Adena apparently disappeared from the archeological record, possibly due to an emerging culture identified as the Hopewell. Archeologists first thought that this was clearly the ending of one culture and the beginning of another. Now this change is seen as the cultural evolution of the same people leading to the Hopewell era, which then flourished in the Ohio River Valley. In this particular part of the world, there were earthworks built as circles and squares and octagons and then miles and miles of just parallel walls. So the designs are very important and had special meaning to the people who made them and they put a great deal of effort into placing these things on the ground. It's important to realize that what we perceive as a mound is really the final stage of construction at that particular location. When no longer in use, ceremonial sites and buildings were turned into burial sites and finally capped off with earth to form the conical shapes we see today. Fortunately, the burial practice of interring the dead with offerings and belongings has allowed us to find many important artifacts. And one of the most spectacular things about these Hopewellian people was their use of exotic raw materials which were fashioned into really finely crafted artifacts. Copper occurs in, in a native nugget form at several locations throughout the eastern United States. There's, there's no local sources of copper here. And really tremendous quantities of that material were brought here to the site and worked into artistic objects. Uh, some of these were objects of personal ornament, uh, like ear spools, little copper discs uh, that were worn at the ears, uh, breastplates, which are associated only with the very highest status individuals. A critical point to remember in the study of cultures like the Hopewell is the danger of drawing all our conclusions about them from evidence found at the mounds, since these ceremonial artifacts don't accurately reflect the day-to-day -day life of the early mound builders. It's important to recognize that these people, that their lives were not entirely focused on uh, death and mortuary behavior. They, they led rich and varied lives like everyone else that involved you know, the whole range of, of human activities and emotions. Uh, these people lived in households and hamlets scattered throughout the river valleys. These settlements have been the focus of the most recent archaeological work being undertaken at Hopewell sites. Excavations at these sites have brought a whole new perspective to the Hopewell culture. Every fragment found becomes a part of an unfolding tapestry of human experience in prehistoric America. This is one of the things that we're finding a lot of here at the site. It's a fragment of a ceramic vessel. Uh, a lot of the uh, pits that we've excavated have uh, a, a large number of pieces, and we believe we'll be able to uh, fit them together and see what the vessels actually looked like. From this fragment, I, th I think we're looking at uh, the upper part of a, of a bowl, and the curvature uh, suggests that it would have been a round bottom vessel probably for storage of something. At a typical Hopewell settlement around 200 AD, there would be a thatched and pole structure for a small number of families to live in. 
because needed resources were scattered far and wide, the settlements were dispersed across the area. Even though they were becoming more and more dependent on agriculture, greater population densities were not yet possible. Something that we have uh, acquired information on really only in the last 20 years is that these people had domesticated plants and through sifting the contents of these trash pits like we're, we're excavating here through very fine mesh using water flotation and in some cases chemical flotation to retrieve charred remains of the foods that they ate, uh, we have found kernels of corn, but we find only occasional kernels or broken, uh, burned parts of cobs, and they clearly knew about it and used it, but it was not part of their agricultural repertoire. The work going on at excavations like these is only part of the effort to understand the prehistoric peoples of North America. The science of archaeology faced a daunting challenge in trying to reconstruct the mound-building cultures of North America. To begin with, the mounds had been constructed of soil and were more prone to the ravages of time than the ancient stone edifices found elsewhere in the world. It is impossible to determine how much more defined building angles were originally and how much the ditches and depressions have been filled in. And time has taken its toll on most of the objects left behind by these fascinating people. Only the faintest traces remain of their basketry, leather, and cloth. If we use a definition of archaeology as the scientific study of the material remains of the human past, all we have left to work with are those material remains that survive. Generally stone artifacts, pottery, some metals. And if most of the earthen structures have been damaged or destroyed, we're dealing with probably less than 10% of what was here originally. And from that, then trying to reconstruct what people were doing here 2,000 years ago. To help fill the void in their understanding of the mound builders, American archaeologists turned to the written accounts of the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto and his expedition into the southeastern United States. De Soto began his four-year trek in 1539, and he encountered some of the last Mississippian settlements along the way. One of the many facts the De Soto documents confirmed was that the temple mounds had ramps leading to the top. Accounts existed of Spanish horsemen riding up them on horseback. By the time America's colonial era began, there were no mound-building populations or direct historic links to their existence. One of the first scientific excavations of a mound was done by the man considered the father of Northern American archaeology, Thomas Jefferson. In 1781, after excavating a small burial mound near Monticello, his home in Virginia, Jefferson had no doubt that this and other mounds in the area were the work of American Indians. In the mid-1840s, the first fairly extensive study of mound sites was conducted by two men working out of Chillicothe, Ohio, Ephraim G. Squire, a local newspaperman, and Edwin H. Davis, a physician. They excavated at nearby Mound City and also explored a large number of other earth mounds and enclosures. Their findings were published by the recently established Smithsonian Institution, they concluded that some of the earthworks were sacred enclosures and that the people who had built them were skilled mathematicians and engineers. Unfortunately, after bringing this ancient American heritage to light, the two men had a falling out and Davis sold his collection of artifacts for $10,000. With no reliable federal or state legislation existing to protect these sites, the destruction and looting of the mounds and their buried treasures became a critical problem. They were very obvious. People excavated them purely out of curiosity, uh, with no record keeping whatsoever. One instance that I know of, a farmer was removing a burial mound, found a copper artifact, and used it to repair his shovel. There were Mississippian mounds that were dynamited, and artifacts hauled out in wheelbarrow loads and sold to people right on the spot, and the collection dispersed all over the country. 
The Spiro Mound site in Oklahoma became known as a veritable treasure trove of artifacts. In the early 1930s, it was labeled the King Tut's Tomb of the Arkansas Valley because it was being ransacked by a mining company that had control of the land. The local citizens were outraged and pressured the Oklahoma legislature into passing an antiquities law in 1935. Unearthed at this site was one of the best preserved and largest of the Mississippian figurines, a human effigy pipe standing 11 inches tall. The adornments, the cap, braid, beaded necklace, and feathered cape, give us a rare portrait of a member of the elite of that particular society. The long fight to preserve the Mississippian site in Alabama, now called Moundville, is an even more dramatic example of people taking pride in local history. In the 1920s, the people banded together and bought pieces of the property containing the mounds whenever they could afford to do so. A young archaeologist named Walter B. Jones mortgaged his house on more than one occasion and labored tirelessly to gain support. In 1929, he wrote, This matter has been before state and federal legislative bodies time and time again, and has never made any headway. In the meantime, the mounds are slowly disintegrating. We robbed the Indians of everything they had, and the least we can do is to preserve this wonderful monument which they left behind. The persistence of Walter Jones and other citizens paid off. In 1933, Mound State Park was established. To create further interest, Jones assisted in the production of a film called Temples and Peace. Most importantly, the film chronicled some of the crucial excavations made by the Alabama Museum of Natural History. One early experiment was to test the amount of effort that went into building the mounds. Assuming that an average basket load contained 35 pounds of soil and a round trip for each bearer took 20 minutes, the project involved approximately 10 million man hours of work. Over a million artifacts were recovered and also well-preserved fireplaces and burial sites just beneath the flooring of dwellings. As indicated by the film title Temples and Peace, the site produced no real evidence of war by or against this particular society. Only 79 arrowheads were found and no other obvious weaponry. Out of 3,000 skulls studied, only two showed damage that could be attributed to violence. The average height of the skeletons was just under 5 feet 4 inches. Curiously, thanks to the Great Depression, much work was done at the mound sites. In 1938, restoration of Moundville was undertaken by work crews of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. As part of the many CCC projects, men were finding themselves in excavation crews under the supervision of a trained archaeologist, and the work they did paid off in many important discoveries. At the Mississippian site of Okmulgee near Macon, Georgia, a railroad had been cut through a mountain that was later discovered to be a large funeral mound. Noted archaeologist A.R. Kelly brought his CCC team to Okmulgee, where they made a clearer crosscut that revealed five distinct layers. These clearly supported the theory that the mounds were built in stages over long periods of time. With only black and white photography available, Kelly commissioned a painting of the find so that he could accurately record the colors within the strata. Kelly and his crew also uncovered a well-preserved floor and reconstructed the building that once stood over it. Most people, when they visit a mound site, see large earthworks, and they think in terms of mounds only. But a unique feature here is the earth lodge that's behind me. It's a reconstructed religious meeting place or cultural meeting place, perhaps a business meeting place. As you enter the earth lodge, around the wall there are 47 seats 
Starting from the entrance and going around to the platform, each seat gets wider and higher until you get the final three seats for a total of 50 on the platform itself. The Earth Lodge itself is an almost perfect circle. It comes within six inches. The upright timbers do form a perfect 16-foot square. The reason the flooring had been so well preserved was that it appears that the site was burned about the time the people moved away. The ceremonial burning of temple sites is thought to have been an integral part of their rituals. But why the site was vacated is the lingering question. For about 2,000 years, the practice of mound building was associated with the most important, if not dominant, cultures of North America. During the Adena, Hopewell, and then Mississippian eras, these cultures seemed poised to become one of the world's great civilizations. But then they seemed to have inexplicably disappeared from the land. One of the things that uh, has impressed me as I work on the Hopewell question is uh, rooted in this long-term stable adaptation that they achieved lasting uh, anywhere from four to 600 years. Uh, when you consider that uh, stability, uh, the mystery of what happened to this cultural tradition becomes even more intriguing. And however we ultimately explain it, whether by demographic growth or climate change or the leaders adopting a new system of relationships or whatever might come out of the archaeological research, uh, this fact of why such a stable adaptation succumbed and was replaced by something else is a very deep part of the mystery. When a culture ceases to exist, the most melodramatic scenarios for its demise are always proposed first. But there is no evidence that warfare, disease, or a cataclysmic event brought an end to these people around 500 AD. Sometimes people overemphasize the mystery of the disappearance of the Hopewell people. But actually, they didn't disappear. The people who built these monuments and made these big earthworks and did all this work and their descendants stayed in the area, we're quite sure, but they made a different way of making their living and their culture evolved into something different, just as our own evolves, changes from what George Washington did to what we did, but we're still here. When it comes to the end of the Mississippian era, we may be talking about something altogether different. Many major Mississippian sites, like Etowah in Georgia, lasted into the 1500s, succumbing about the time of European incursion into the continent. The Natchez people of Louisiana, who practiced many of the Mississippian traditions until around the year 1700, probably died out after De Soto and later French explorers unknowingly unleashed a form of bacterial warfare on the Native American populations. But this isn't the reason for the demise of Cahokia 200 years earlier. Perhaps the very fact that it was home to the biggest Mississippian population was the reason for its early decline in the 1300s. Many theories for its demise are based on the kinds of problems that continually plague urban settings. The population may simply have grown beyond the ability of the land to support it. For example, one of the reasons Cahokia declined was because they ran out of wood. And that's clearly shown in the rebuilding of the stockade. Much larger stockade logs at the beginning, down to very small stockade logs at the end, suggesting that the, the wood in the immediate vicinity is being cut down and doesn't have time to replenish. So it may be that people are simply running out of resources to support a large population in that immediate area. One of the least looked at variables in terms of the collapse of these Mississippian societies, in particular Cahokia, is the role of environmental change, particularly climatic change. And over this area, you have essentially three large air masses. Uh, one of these air masses uh, involves the uh, hot, dry air coming off the plains. And so it's very possible that uh, there were, it was much drier. We know, for example, out in Iowa, there were droughts that were happening at about 1200 AD. Uh, it may not even be drought, it could be uh, continuous rains. 
Certainly one of the things we do see is that there appears to have been a much higher water table at about 1300 AD because people are located on higher portions of the floodplain. Some of the new work we've been doing suggests that the end of Cahokia is not a slow decline. In fact, that it may be very rapid. And this gives more credence to the idea that the end of Cahokia is a political phenomenon rather perhaps than an environmental one. We know that it was a chiefdom. Chiefdoms are unstable. There are many competing groups. It is very likely that the end of Cahokia came through something like civil war and that it created a situation in effect where there were no winners and that you had basically a dispersal of elites with their followers throughout perhaps the west and to the north and that simply was the end of Koki. It was rapid. It may have taken place in 10 or 20 years rather than 100 years. We may never fully know the true reasons for the disappearance of the mound builders, but modern research has at least been able to shine new light on their ancient way of life. Our images of early Native Americans has undergone a startling transformation from simple hunter-gatherers to creators of thriving, sophisticated societies. It's discoveries such as these which keep the past eternally new and reawaken our desire to go in search of history.